Thanks for everyone coming. Um, my name is Sean Stovey. I'm a developer based out in Leeds. Uh, I have a, beat, a bit of a beat in my bonnet about application security. Uh, so I just decided one day um, to start talking about security because I keep seeing the same problems again and again in, uh, through a number of applications that I've worked on and people I've worked with. Um, so I hope you find this evening informative and useful. Uh, so we're going to talk about why security. Uh, you might not think it applies to you. I didn't think it applied to me. I didn't think I, anything I worked on was particularly interesting. So I'll be talking about why that and some case studies relating to that. Um, who you might get hacked by or you know, who, who you might get, be are getting hacked by at the moment but are not aware of it. Um, how the exploits occur and then particularly uh, solutions and how countermeasures. Um, so I, I found when I was investigating security that there was a lot of individual pages on this is the hack, this is the countermeasure, but there wasn't particularly one place you could go to to get um, a, a body of best practice. So that's why I set up the Security Essentials solution uh, on GitHub, where, you, where everything I talk about this evening is in one place and you can take bits from it as you see fit. And then once you've done your beautifully secure uh, project, how you then hand that off to the, the, the server guy or gal uh, and what they should do on the server to, to put the icing on the cake, as it were. Uh, and talk a little about further resources and do a bit of a summary. So this is a two-hour talk, uh, which I've got an hour and a quarter to present in. So I'm going to do two things. I'm going to talk fast and I've cut out some material. So if I'm not making myself clear at any point, feel free to put up your hand. Uh, and uh, keep putting up your hand because I can't see all of you in... in um, and questions at the end. So my name is John Stavely, I'm an MVC, MVC.NET developer, I'm a contractor in Leeds. I've been working um, .NET for about 15 years now uh, as a contractor for five. Um, I've done about 100 to 200 hours on security, which doesn't qualify me as an expert. If you want an expert, you probably want to go to GCHQ. They've done their 10,000 hours in security. But I, I keep finding that having done 100 to 200 hours in security does actually qualify me as some kind of expert because I seem to know a lot more than um, a lot of people I've worked with. So, yeah, what we want is a great, great result at the end of the day, a good project, not getting hacked, not losing loads of money uh, or reputation of the company we're working for, um, and, and a bit less of that. And I, I kept coming across a bit of that. Really simple things that develop problems developers were putting into their code uh, that could be really easily avoided. So um, hence me coming on this roadshow, as it were. Uh, so uh, 2014, a colossally bad year for security, millions of pounds uh, down, the, down the drain, and liability, records lost, customers upset, which was absolutely the worst year since 2013, which is the worst year since 2012, which is the worst year since, and it keeps going on and on. So this problem is not going away, it's getting worse and worse. Uh, and it, it's uh, talked about the highest level. So at Davos in 2015, where all the global business leaders meet, that they're talking about information security. And if you talk to the Federation of Small Businesses, they reckon that 41% of businesses have been the victim of cybercrime so uh, uh, resulting in a loss between five to 10,000 pounds. So big company or small company, this is affecting you. It could be affecting your pensions. So take an interest in security. Uh, so some examples, Sony lost films, confidential email, um, criticizing the government, <coughs> payroll details, which will resulting in them being sued when they work out that their female workers are actually paid disproportionately to their male workers. Uh, Target lost, um, had a point of sale exploit in their systems which was capturing all the credit card details and posting them off to uh, a foreign website. That has currently cost them 110 million pounds. It will probably end up costing them half a billion pounds. Um, Home Depot, 156 million credit card details and 53 million email addresses lost. JP Morgan, bad USB, the worst physical exploit um, ever recorded on a, on a security device. Uh, this was just 2014. <coughs> iCloud, new celebrity pictures pasted all over the internet. 
um, Snapchat, you know, Ditto, eBay, losing millions of pounds. And what I'll talk about is the simple exploits that this involves and how they could be avoided. Hopefully, possibly the, the worst SSL vulnerability ever recorded. Uh, this is not a good year or a time to be in security. Well, it's a good time if you're fighting security, but um, as developers, you know, the onus is on us to do something about this. Um, and let's face it, this is just the tip of the iceberg. If you're a company with shareholders, are you going to tell them that you tell them that you've got hacked or your systems are vulnerable and secure and you need to spend hundreds of millions of pounds, lots of liability associated with that? No, you're not. You're going to do absolutely everything you can to make sure that that, that stays hidden um, so that your customers are, aren't upset, your shareholders aren't upset, um, and any liability associated with it gets, gets hidden. So the ones that you hear about are the ones that are absolutely too big uh, to cover up. So why should you care about security? Well, loss of reputation. When LinkedIn got hacked, lots of people got upset that their password details were splashed all over the internet. Uh, you might get blacklisted as, as a site if you start if your site starts emailing millions of emails um, details about some factory in China they should go and buy slippers from. Uh, you could be sued, as in the case of Sony. Uh, and uh, yeah, fines, data, data protection vulnerabilities, and PCI compliance. I'll add to that um, with the Ashley Madison uh, hack. You will now they had suicides because when people discovered that they're actually cheating on their partners and all of that information was splashed all over the internet, uh, a few people killed themselves because they didn't want the uh, the shame of it. So lots and lots of reasons why you should care about security. Um, so I say this is a, I know, abbreviate the talk, so I'm just going to talk about web application security, particularly focusing on MVC and what you should be doing and what you shouldn't be doing. Uh, not going to be covering physical security, uh, gentlemen and ladies at the door giving you badges, not going to talk about that. Network security, Trojans, worms, viruses, internal detection systems, firewalls, and pots. these are like network problems that you're going to talk about and generally relate, relate to internal threats. We're not going to talk about the disgruntled employee. If you need to protect yourself from your own employees, you need to go to a whole extra level of security, uh, which we're not going to talk about here. We, we're talking about port 80, port 443, exposed over the internet, how are we getting in that way? If you're protecting yourself against your employees, then there's a whole new ball game to talk about. Uh, advanced persistent threats, nation states that want to hack you. If, if the Chinese government wants to hack you, it's basically game over. You don't stand a chance. You, they have the knowledge and the resources, and you don't. Um, and the extended version of this presentation includes distributed denial of service attack, which I won't be covering today, or social engineering. That's getting to, getting to the keys to the kingdom through you guys and the, the call center, usually. <coughs> so, um, I'm a lazy developer, I want the absolute maximum bang for my buck, I want to do the minimum amount of work to deliver the maximum amount of security. So the approach I've taken to this presentation is I'll be covering the Open Web Application Security Project Top 10. So this is the top 10 threats on the web today in terms of impact and probably problems you're affecting you. So I'll be covering the biggest threats first and then working uh, through to the, the smaller threats. So uh, assuming everyone's attention span will gradually fade as the beer becomes you know, flowing through the system. <laughs> uh, so OWASP, a not-for-profit organization, uh, they publish it every three years. They cover all technologies, not just .NET stack. Uh, and this kind of helps prioritize the things you're looking at. So if you've done nothing on security, start on number one and keep working backwards. Uh, so if you reach the top 10, I'm going to cover what is the out, what is the hack, what does it involve, how do they exploit your system, uh, brief details on who has been affected by it, which, which helps to sort of illustrate how it works, and what you can do about it. Uh, and then, you know, questions if you've got something. I'm not going to do any demos, I'm just going to refer you to the Security Central project where all of the code lives. Right, so the number one vulnerability 
in the world today is SQL injection. So uh, this is little Bobby Tables, WKCD. Um, hi, uh, this is your son's school. We're having some computer trouble. Um, oh dear, did he break something? Well, in a way, did you really name your son Robert apostrophe bracket semicolon drop table student semicolon dash dash? <laughs> oh yes, little Bobby Tables we call him. Well, we've just lost all of this year's student records. I hope you're happy. And I hope you've learned to sanitize your database inputs. So this is the classic SQL injection uh, attack. Now, the good news is you're all .NET developers and all use SQL Server and stored procedures, yes? <laughs> yeah. Uh, however, I keep finding organizations that don't, uh, which is why I'm going to mention it briefly. So it, it would work <coughs> like this. Um, so instead of putting a, a parameterized SQL uh, stored procedure, um, you compose a, a, a SQL string, which you then fire against the database. So in, the, in this little Bobby Tables example, uh, you've got a username password combination, which is concatenated into this string. Yeah, so give me the user where, which satisfies this condition here. And then execute it against the database. However, if you put in the username field, admin apostrophe and one equals one, then that part of the, uh, this query automatically becomes true and it ignores everything else. And it becomes that. So like start from users when username equals admin and one equals one, don't care about the rest. So one equals one is always true. So give me the user where the username is admin, password field, you can put whatever you want in it, drop table users, as in the Bobby Tables example. Now, did you really give, want to give your user the capacity to execute any SQL they wanted to against your database? If you're concatenating strings, which then filing into the database, you are susceptible to SQL injection, and you need to do something about it. So, like the .NET developers generally not in that camp. This is number one threat because of the LAMP stack. So MySQL don't have very good stored procedure support, so you find lots of developers using unsanitized input and creating strings like this, which are filed against the database. However, I've also seen it in other scenarios. So like we had a reporting engine, and the developer thought be, and the remit was give the users the ability to write reports, any report they wanted against yeah. the database. So basically said, oh, yeah, okay, well, I'll just write something that could allow them to um, execute uh, a, store, um, a SQL against it. And then the, uh, the penetration tester went in, backed up the database, downloaded the database through the reporting engine. Uh, and that's one example you could do um, to gain all of the username password combinations in the system. Yeah, so Bobby Tables. Uh, and you can do it through um, query strings as well if you're, if you're doing, if you're using the input of a query string in a, um, and cat into string as well. Uh, if you're interested, there's a demo on Havage, how this is just um, really au automated. And there's a, a YouTube video of a four-year-old using Havage to do a SQL injection attack. It's, it's that simple to exploit. It's weaponized. Is anyone doing that, by the way? No one wants to admit it. Okay, that's good. <laughs> a situation a couple of years ago where I'd done parameterized query done properly. Yeah. It was incredibly slow. I had to go back to concatenation. I sanitized concatenation. So just that was if you're sanitizing your input, that's fine. That was about 50 times faster. Yeah. But you, I've also seen examples where you've got parameterized <coughs> stored procedure, but then you're doing SP underscore SQL and then the string. That is vulnerable to a SQL injection attack as well. But if you do um, parameters through store procedure, then it automatically sanitizes it for you and it'll just treat it as a string, the, the parameter as a string, as it were. So. Okay, so number two is broken authentication session management. Um, so that's got three <coughs> sections here. Uh, password security, session hijacking, and weak account management. And I'll go through each of those with you. Um, so you've had the, the encryption guy come here, I can't remember his name, he came up to Leeds, he's doing something on encryption hacking, um, .NET Rocks recently. Stephen Haunts. Stephen Haunts, 
So you know all about encryption and hashing? No? Okay. Uh, so this, how, how should you uh, store your passwords? So we generally think about defense in depth in security. So you've got to assume that your password database will end up on a hard, on a USB drive, on a bus somewhere. It got lost. You've got to assume that the attackers are going to penetrate your first level of security and will get to some important information you want to protect. Um, so, for instance, if you're doing password storage in plain text, that is no kind of security whatsoever. Uh, and there's uh, a website there, Plain Text Defenders, where you can go and shop them. Uh, any in any organisation to send you your password as a password reminder. That means they're storing it as plain text. Um, Base64 coding is a completely re reversible process. That's no kind of protection at all. Uh, and again, avoid encryption because it's a two-way process. If they can get the key, then they can unencrypt all of the data. So what you do is something called password hashing. So this is a hash, and it's a hash of the word password. So the idea with a hash is you can take a single word, a single letter, all the complete works of Shakespeare and reduce it to a string like that. So what you do is you take the username and the password, you hash the password and compare the hashed password with one in the database. Therefore, if they get the, the hashed version, they can't reverse it back to the original password in most cases. Uh, however, common hashes can be Google. Um, you should always use a salt because that increases the amount of randomness in the, in the hashing. Um, and these hashes are all vulnerable, so RC4, MD5, and SHA-1 can all be reverse engineered fairly easily using a, a decent graphics card. Uh, so the tool you use to do that is called HashCat, and that can, that can calculate billions and billions of hashes a second. So if you're not using a good hashing algorithm, then it's the same as using no hashing algorithm at all, and they can guess your password. So what you should be using is something called PBKDF2, S-Crypt, or B-Crypt. And they're decent hashes. In terms of the passwords you should be using, you should enforce a minimum complexity. Because the first thing that, um, with Hashcat, for instance, you can take a dictionary of the commonly used passwords, uh, and it will start with those. So it gives it like a seed, a starting point to to create uh, to start calculating the hashes. And as soon as it's got your hash, then it can guess what the password was. Then it can go into the website. And if you've reused your password, like a lot of people do, then you can then use that to get into other websites. Um, some developers reject special characters because they think they're avoiding some kind of SQL injection attack. There's really no need to do that. If you're doing an escape stored procedure, then um, it, it should be fine. Uh, and it reduces the comp possible complexity. Uh, yeah, and don't use uh, known bad passwords. The, the first thing on the list is Password, password, um, password one, let me in. They're, they're all on there as like the dictionary of stuff we should try first. So it, again, it doesn't matter if you're ha really hashing it well. If you're using a bad password in the start, like, you're not protecting yourself. Uh, yeah, and don't put, if his username is John Stavely, don't put the password as John Stavely as well. That's again another thing they will try. Uh, some websites disallow paste on a, on a web page. They think it's actually preventing bots from um, uh, doing repeat attacks on the website, but it doesn't because they can just bypass it. And it pisses off users because they, then they can't use the innate password manager in the web page um, or, or an external web, part, web stack manager to, to do things to store the password. Um, so uh, this is Richard Price. I shared a house with him at university. He's also known as the Data Stream Cowboy. Uh, this is the suit he wore when he went to court facing extradition to the US for hacking into the Pentagon. Um, he just used a dictionary attack. So he just said, like, this is the password. I tried a load of usernames, tried a dictionary against it, and then he got some hits. And he changed the salaries of top brass in the US Pentagon. and accessing Air Force based records and all sorts of stuff. Um, eBay were hacked in May 2014. Uh, they used very poor hashing in their, in their database and got 145 million user records splashed all over the internet. Just cost them 200 million, not a lot for them, I suppose. Uh, yeah, they lost, my, they lost my password. I was really annoyed. Stolen by the Russian mafia. Um, so, in the Security Central project, 
it's using PBK TF2. Uh, it denies commonly used passwords. It's got a dictionary of really bad passwords, and it says no, you can't use this, and it enforces a minimum strength, uh, minimum complexity of upper, lowercase, and numbers. Um, yeah, so this is Have I Been Pwned? So this is such an industry now of hacked password databases that you can go on and register um, your username. So if you get hacked somewhere, it'll just email you whenever, uh, whenever you get hacked. I've, I've only appeared twice on this. So session hijacking. Um, that's an anonymous mask and that's a cookie monster. <laughs> what is a cookie? Right, so this is an authentication cookie. So uh, I've got a .NET Nuke site, and it dumps, and when I log in, it dumps this cookie in the browser, so you can see it there. Uh, and there's a demo I can do where I log in, I get that text, I then log out, uh, go to another PC, and use that cookie with one line of JavaScript and inject it in and refresh the .NET Nuke page and I'm logged in as an admin user. Now that browser or computer has never seen my cookie, they don't know anything about it. So that kind of blew my mind when I looked at this because I thought, well, hang on a second, isn't my application tracking whether I'm logged in and logged off? But it actually doesn't. When I log off, all it does is delete that cookie. That cookie still says I'm admin and my session ends in 15 minutes. So if that's valid, I can then use that cookie to log in anywhere around the world. Because by, by default, .NET, the applications don't check that sessions expired or not. Um, so what, what they try and do is grab the cookie. So that, they, they do a classic man in the middle attack. So it could be um, someone in a, a coffee shop uh, grabbing the cookie as it's going over the web it's an <coughs> internet service provider it could be kept in the web log somewhere or they can just open up the browser or they can do something called a cross-site request forgery where a little bit of script that's, that they put into the web page runs grabs the cookie and posts it off to a third-party website I'll be going over cross-site request forgery later um, sensor data exposure so if you've got something like Elmer um, or trace.axd running on your machine, it will, it will have a list of all of the cookies that were valid when the, error, the exception occurred or the page hit occurred. So they can use that to then log in as admin or whatever it is they want to do. So that's the demo I was talking about. What can you do against this? Well, the cookie should be set, um, set as HTTP only, then it can't be accessed by um, any script that's running in the page. So if they've somehow managed to get the script running in your page via a cross-site scripting attack, then they still can't access it. Uh, the, you then you can protect yourself by sending the cookie over HTTPS. So um, some pages, even if you require HTTPS, the, the cookie will be sent over HTTP, so that can be sniffed at any, at any point between your computer and the server. Uh, so in your web.config, it should look like that. You should require SSL, set the timeout to a reasonably small value. So even if they do capture the cookie, you're, you're less vulnerable and select signing expiration default. So again, it reduces the window of attack. <coughs> uh, yeah, and all of these cookies tend to be logged habitually uh, for no good reason in your logs. Um, one thing you can do is also track sessions. So in the example I gave where I logged into my .NET Uke site and then logged out, the, the site can be set to, to track the sessions. It doesn't do that by default because of the fairly onerous performance impact it has. So every single request, get, post, put, etc., the site says, is this user authenticated? And when you do log off, it actually says to the site, I am now logged off. So that's off by default. Are there any, um, I appreciate there will always be a, a compromise, but are there any solutions for that that don't involve tracking part of the cookie server side as well? No. I know you can sort of put the IP address in the cookie. No, because you need, a, you need a central point of 
is this user logged on or not? And that's got to be the server. config with the appropriate transform, so it enforces SSL in production, that kind of thing. Uh, so weak account, account management, they, you might think that your data is the dullest in the world, but you probably contain, at minimum, contain some username and passwords that can be reused elsewhere. Um, so for instance, uh, my account was hacked over in the, in the last month, and I got a notification from Facebook saying, um, Chrome in Berry has tried to access your account. I was in southern Spain at the time, so I knew it wasn't me. Uh, so what would have happened there is another account would have reused that password, had been, would have been hacked. He'd then taken that username password combination and tried it on other well-known sites. So that's what they want to do there. They want to own, the, own your account, so it gets sensitive data, admin privileges to the site, if your site is particularly interesting. And the surface area you're looking at of account management is anywhere you're registering the user, logging on, uh, resetting the password, changing account details or security information, logging off, or particularly one thing that's forgotten is the call center. So the call center often have um, overrides. So you speak, go and speak nicely to uh, the, the call center staff, do a bit of social engineering, and you can just bypass all of the really funky security you've done. Uh, so Sarah Palin was. Um, presidential, vice presidential candidate. And she had her account hacked. So the news contained details that Sarah Palin used Yahoo. Guess what her email address was? Sarah.yahoo.com, <coughs> yeah, okay. Um, so the user just needed to, to get access to <coughs> their account, they just needed the security information. And Yahoo required that they're, they're, one of your security information was their birthday. That was two minutes on Wikipedia. <laughs> and another bit of security information required was their zip code. Well, she's from Wali, Walisa, and that only has two, two passcodes, so not exactly a huge, a huge database of things to guess. Uh, and the third bit of security information was where did you meet your spouse? Again, five minutes Googling on the internet, um, and there was an interview with her, she met her spouse in high school and then they can reset the account. So username, few bits of security information, reset, enter your new password here they know and have the username and password combination and access to all of Sarah Palin's emails. So that's weak account management. Uh, so you can do also do something called account enumeration. So yeah what I should have said is that you can't if you can Google all the information that's in your security, then it's probably not great uh, security. <coughs> and you can also do something called account enumeration. So this is guessing all of the users that are in the database, and that occur on registration, log on, or password reset. So if you, for instance, you're doing a password reset, um, the, a bad system would say an account reset key has been emailed to you. Uh, and a bad one would say that user and if it didn't exist, then it'd say, well, that, that user account doesn't exist. What it should say is not give anything away and just say an account reset key has been emailed to you. Because if you don't do that, then they can just batter through billions of combinations of um, first name, last name, and gmail.com, for instance, uh, and see what users are using your account. And they have automated systems to do this, so it's no cost to them. Uh, another thing you do is require HTTPS, so if you're sending the username password combination over uh, HTTP, I know it seems obvious, but I, I keep seeing systems that don't have this, then you can do a required HTTPS attribute of the method to ensure that it's sent over in a secure manner. And that also should apply to account reset uh, and changing the security information. You th that can be logged all sorts of intermediary steps between you and the server. Uh, you can, they can sometimes force um, a denial of service. So if your system set to lock out after a number of failed email attempts, then they can basically do a denial of service and lock all of your users out of the system, which is probably not what you intended. So the, the, the generally accepted way of doing things is doing failure, um, but then delaying the amount of time before they can try again. So you can use capture, which is, these we've all seen these, 
So this prevents bots going on a website and pounding it with thousands of requests. Um, and you can also do throttling. So you say, right, the, the password reset page can only accept two requests from the same IP address within 60 seconds, for instance. Um, there's, I think there's anti-capture where they're, they're paying, uh, as a counter that, um, they're, they're paying Vietnamese people $2 for 200 images to decode that. So they've got, they, they publish an API where this image is scanned, sent over to Vietnam, there's got this guy there tapping away, and then, uh, and then that comes back, and your API receives that, and it can bypass anti-capture. You can also bypass it, throttling just by having a massive botnet as well. But, you know, you're slowing them down, you're doing something to, to stop them attacking your site. The only way you can verify an email address is by sending an email, so that's generally what they do. There's too many different combinations of what an email should look like where you can just do a regex on it. So verify an account that way. Uh, and a lot, of, a lot of sites these days we challenge on key actions like changing security information. Oh, I, I see you're changing your password um, or username. Please, can you uh, reconfirm your email for me, uh, your security information? Uh, yeah, and Facebook very helpfully t told me when my account had been hacked and I was in, in southern Spain uh, so I could actually do something about it. Whereas uh, a lot of, if, if someone's attacked your account and you don't, and you don't know, then you can't do anything about it. Um, yeah, so if, if you've just got a plain vanilla where you can just tap in password, password reset, then they can do an account enumeration of all users in your account and then just rattle through and do a, uh, a password reset on all of your users, and that, that's effectively a denial of service attack. And send the email, should, when you do a password reset, send the email with an expiring token, so they can only do it within a certain window. So if that gets logged anywhere, that it, it shouldn't do, that they've got um, a limited window of vulnerability. Uh, choose your security questions. Well, you know, in Sarah Palin's case, uh, if you can Google it, it's probably not great security. Size specific, large range of answers, not their, not their postcode. Uh, low discoverability, constant overtime. F people's favorite films change. You know. uh, yeah, uh, I've seen a couple of people try to roll away membership providers. Don't. You're not clever enough, I'm not clever enough. There's other people who spend a lot of time and energy doing this. Uh, good option, outsource the, the, the solution as your Active Directory or OpenID or Good Solution to do this. They will maintain the, the security base, they will keep up to date so you don't have to. So in the Security Central's project, there's a pretty decent account management process. Uh, it prevents anti enumeration it prevents <coughs> throttling, it's got capture, it logs um, any attempt to change uh, security information, verifies the email, emails, email notification and any changes, uh, logs all activity, um, sets autocomplete off, so I didn't mention that. Um, I worked on an NHS application where they knew all of the, all of the nurses would go to a single terminal to, to register, so they, um, they set on all of the registration fields no autocomplete, which means that they when the next person went there, they didn't see all the security information pre-filled from the pro previous person who was on at the terminal. And increased login time failure, as I mentioned. Right, part three, cross-site scripting. Right, so imagine I've got a website and it takes this um, query string here and then I'm doing something really clever with it and outputting hello guest uh, on HTML. And then, but, but me being a clever user, I then start putting some angle brackets in it. Oh, hang on, my angle brackets have gone, but it's now in bold. Is that what I wanted? Oh, hang on, look, I'm putting some scripts in here. Oh, look, right, so I'm now executing scripts on the page. Is that what I intended? Um, and what this does is that it changes, it changes all of the links to 
on, on your page to a nasty site. So if the user clicks <coughs> on any page on your site, it will then go to their nasty site. So that's called a cross-site scripting attack. The vulnerability allows an attacker to run their script <laughs> on your site. Yeah, or anything else they want. Um, so the difference is encoded data versus uncoded. What you actually wanted is that. So when that was reflected in HTML, it would appear as angle brackets uh, and not as that, so which would be formatted HTML or script. So what they typically want to do with it is, ex is execute some script. And that will capture, for instance, the, the cookies. If you do that, it will then say, all right, this is my authentication cookie. And then they can do a, very, a bit of jQuery and get that posted off to their nasty site. Uh, and then they'll have something chugging away in the background using those cookies to then log on to your site uh, and gain admin access or change data or whatever it is they want to achieve. Uh, don't trust your users. Uh, <coughs> assume that there's going to be malicious content coming into your site. So validate everything that's coming in and use whitelisting. Um, so is it, you know, reflected versus persisted. Persisted is more impactful. It's because the code is in your database. So it's typically have some content management systems. Uh, so whenever whenever a user goes to that page, they then have the reflected cross-site scripting attack and grabs the cookies, for instance, reflected as one time only. Uh, typically happens in social networks, email, so you get a link, uh, click on this link, and it's got a load of gump that you can't see pasted after it, uh, which then performs a cross-site scripting attack on the vulnerable site. Um, so I used to work for a law firm, and we had a, a computer science graduate from Trinity College Dublin working in the help desk, and computer science graduates from Trinity College are very bored people. They're not being stimulated in an effective way. Um, so you, in the content management system, you can put all sorts of notes in. But his notes were flashing. They had little squallies, marquees, alerts popping up. So this is a cross-site scripting attack that our case management system was vulnerable to. Uh, it, it was benign in this case. It wasn't doing anything nasty. But uh, it's something that we took care of pretty quickly when we realized it was happening. What they want to do is steal your session, gain admin privileges, or... Um, privileged information. Um, so uh, the Chinese last year attacked GitHub using something called the Great Canon. So what they did is they injected um, a bit of script at the internet service provider level on uh, a huge range of websites which would be accessed throughout the whole world, um, which would pound GitHub with loads and thousands and thousands or well, millions of requests. Uh, so that's a kind of um, denial of service you can achieve with the cross-site scripting attack. Uh, grab all sorts of sensitive data, nude pictures, for instance. Uh, yeah, eBay were hacked. Um, About.com, when I did this presentation, there'd been 99.98% of their links had been susceptible for about six months. So you could inject anything you wanted in About.com. It was a bit of a, a monstrosity. Don't trust your users? I've been saying that a lot. Validate input. The sources of data can be all sorts of things, not just posts, but also, as we've seen in query stings, URLs. <coughs> uh, I've seen this happen in Excel. CSV import, where the, 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 you, the developer just assumed that all the content they were getting in was good and bona fide and just immediately imported it into the database. Yeah, don't trust your users. Cookie values as well. Sorry? Cookie values as well. Don't yeah. trust cookie values. Yeah, yeah, I suppose so. Yeah, depends what you're putting in them. Yeah. So um, with MV3, C3, they have, they introduced the modicum of protection. And if you try and post something that looks like HTML into a page, you'll get this error message. In MVC2, you weren't protected. Uh, if you d actually do want to post HTML, then you just slap the uh, allow HTML attribute on there. But again, you need to use some kind of whitelisting approach, otherwise they can still do a cross-site scripting attack on it. Uh, encode all data. So you can do something called HTML encoding and decoding. You, you encode the data so it looks like what they intended. 
rather than rather than reflecting HTML, for instance. MVC encodes HTML by default, and if you want to get around that, you do HTML raw. Um, however, if for say fragments of other types of languages like uh, CSS, URLs, <coughs> JavaScript, LDAP, then you need to use something called the anti cross site scripting library, which Microsoft produce, and you encode using that, and it uses a whitelisting approach, um, which which says this is this is known good, it's always going to be good as opposed to a blacklisting approach, which, is, um, which may change over time. Uh, and in the Security Central's project, I incorporate the cross, anti-cross-site scripting library and give an example of it. Web forms was a bit tricky. So there, there's sort of a patchy coverage. So for instance, in, in the data grid, it, it encodes everything in the cells, but if they can get content into the headers, then that's not encoded. So they can do a cross-site scripting attack that way. But hopefully that will have got better over time. So we're going to talk about something called insecure direct object references. Right, so say I want to give on my site the ability to edit, or edit um, users or a, a user, for instance, if I want to edit my own information. Uh, and I've got something that I go in there and if I provide the ID and then passes out into a view model uh, the user details. That's all very great, but what if what if I'm not actually that user and I'm not an admin? Don't I need to do some kind of checking? So yeah, if user not used to get user ID, so I'm, I'm getting the user that I'm providing via the ID and then checking that I'm actually that user, uh, and you can add on the end there, or admin. Uh, and if I'm not, then provide an error back. Otherwise, just provide the, the, the user details. Is that clear? So this is the direct object reference, and it's insecure because I'm not checking that the user should have access to it. Uh, so if you've used the Mobile website, it's, uh, it's a burglar's shopping list of uh, all sorts of good information, and they have an indirect, uh, insecure direct object reference vulnerability in their site. So if you use the Mobilize, it's like I have an iPad, it's this serial number and it's registered against this address. I've got this bicycle that's, um, and I've got this computer. Um, so that if the police find, locate some stolen items, they can go on this website and find out who they belong to. The problem is, is that Immobilize made it so they basically iterate through all of the properties and uh, get all of the list of addresses and all the valuable items that were in there. <laughs> and there was no checking of whether the user should be there. So it was like <coughs> two lines of Python script, um, blasted the site, grabbed all the, scraped all the information off it and stored it in the database. But nothing got out, don't worry about it. Your, your, your iPad is safe. Um, they, they got on top of that pretty quickly. But that's a good example of an indirect secure, direct object reference. Uh, Citigroup, a bank, uh, lost loads of account information details by not checking the user should be there. What can you do? Yeah, okay, we've, gone, we've covered that. Uh, another thing you can do is not exposing internal keys externally, so you can like alias things from doing a, a, a GUID, or a, uh, better yet, a short-term GUID that refers to the internal reference. Uh, and so it, Developers tend to look in one place and not others, so there's areas they can get caught out on, like like their main web pages will all be secure and do checking, but the Ajax calls won't. Um, they'll rely on obfuscation to cover everything up, which generally doesn't work, um, uh, because the, the parts can get captured in a lot of different places and get reused. Uh, and I cover it out in the user edit of it. I just check the user's meant to be there. I'm doing time. Okay, when do I need to stop? When the pizza arrives. When the pizza arrives. Right, okay. <laughs> Security misconfiguration. Do you remember when Windows Server came with everything switched on? We do this, we do that, we do the other. Not anymore. Now it's all off by default. There's a good reason for that. It's because that in increased massively the service area of attack that the users could, uh, the bad guys could use. So FTP on by default, S SMTP on by default, all, all ports open. You can do everything. Now it's all off. 
uh, another major no-no, the full passwords being enabled, uh, it's still enabled, or the user not being forced to change it as soon as they log in. SQL Server 2005, I think, SA password was blank by default. That caused a lot of problems. <laughs> yes, yes, convenient, yeah. yeah. Um, what we'll talk about is the the, the, the security usability trade-off is in the, as, as you increase security, there is a commensurate drop in usability. So three-factor authentication is more difficult to use than two-factor authentication. However, it increases your security. So it's, it's what's appropriate for your application. Uh, so yeah, in, reviewing internal information, implementation details, uh, database structure, application structure, that kind of thing via tracer.axd. They can use this information to gain a, to understand how your system works and find vulnerabilities to it. Uh, so uh, yeah, web uh, like a um, couple of hundred thousand webcams where the the webcam was available over the internet by default, uh, and the admin password didn't require to be changed. And uh, so basically, they just knew, did a scan of all the ports over the internet and found hundreds of thousands of webcams that they could like, look at the people's bedrooms, look at people's drives, look at their babies, you know, that, that kind of thing. Um, they, uh, there was one case where they, they had a talkback um, facility on the webcam, so they actually, the, the parents actually came home and found that their webcam was screaming at their baby. Uh, there's actually a Google Doc you can do, like um, Google in your L, uh, so that finds all instances of Elma.exd on the internet, and it just goes. <laughs> this is all the, all the sites with vulnerable inform with security information splattered all over the internet. Uh, one of the things you can do is encrypt an in in connection string. So it's going security in depth. Assume they're going to uh, have access to everything somehow. Create layers of layers of security. You can put the server in retail mode, so this turns off debug and forces SSL, uh, turns off trace, that kind of thing. So even if you forget it in web.config, it's enforced on the server. Uh, yeah, and ensure the application set for production and automate it using MVC config transforms, which I'm sure everyone does. Uh, and yeah, I just do that in security central projects. So, sensitive data exposure, what does that mean? Uh, so, you might not, have, uh, I used to work on waste databases and thought, there's no, there's no way anyone's gonna be interested in what I'm doing. It's, it's like tonnages of poo shoved into landfill. Well, actually, we were storing some information, username, password information, which users were then likely to use uh, across different websites. So, we're, we're not protecting our users effectively by not but not doing justice and uh, putting security on uh, all levels of the application. So one thing they typically want to get at is email addresses, so they can add them to sell them on to spammers. The contents of emails, for instance, in an extreme case in the case of Sarah Palin, uh, and password details, which you know you can reuse. So if they got it on my Wednesday database space website, then they can go onto PayPal and start doing spending and bank transfers in their name. And yeah, the, the key to that is the auth token. So once you've got the keys to the kingdom, it's easy to then log on. They also might want the, the credit card details which can be sold on. Needy pictures of celebrities, very common one. Uh, yeah, Snapchat, naked people. Um, oh, Snapchat had this great feature. Um, which, find all my friends. So I just submit a list of, part, a list of phone numbers and it, it gave me, oh, all of these friends are using Snapchat. Unfortunately, it didn't stop. So uh, someone with two lines of Python enumerated all of the mobile phone numbers in use in the US, fired it at Snapchat, and then enumerated all the accounts that way. So that's billions and billions of numbers, and Snapchat didn't think that it should be doing anything about that. So they were brute forcing the system, where it should have said, well, no, you." Maximum number of friends you can have at the moment is 200, and then try again in a month, and we'll, we'll let you do another 200, not billions all in one go. 
uh, what uh, Tunisian ISP was doing. Um, do you remember, remember where Gmail was unencrypted? Well, uh, the, the login page was unencrypted for a while. And I think it was because of Tunisian ISP. What it was doing, it, when the, the Facebook page or the Gmail page was coming over the wire via HTTP, it was injecting its little bit of script. Um, so when the user logged in, because the Tunisian government at the time, this is before the Arab Spring, wanted to spy on their, their residents, so it would then grab that username password combination and then post it uh, to a third party website, which then they then, you then use to log in. So that was only possible because the original page was coming over HTTP. Uh, when Go Google and Yahoo and Facebook went to HTTPS, that became no longer possible. Uh, and the Wi Fi pineapple, this is a $100 bit of kit. Basic, this is the classic cafe attack where. Um, you you try you get onto your laptop. Yeah, I want some free Wi-Fi. There's the st the strongest Wi-Fi signal because it's the hacker sitting next to me. Though I don't know it, so I attach to that, and then uh, it's 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 tapping all of the information, insecure information, tra traveling between me and whatever sites I'm going to. So yeah, uh, require SSL forces that any information has to be sent over SSL. Um, there's really no excuse for not using, that's star SSL.com, so it didn't come out well. Uh, there's no excuse for not using SSL really, no, uh, and when I say SSL I really mean TLS because SSL is now is defunct, SSL 2 and 3 have been superseded by TLS. So you can go on and get a free um, uh, SSL certificate now. So everything you do can be encrypted. And when Google did a study of this, they say when they went from completely from HTTP to HTTPS, they said that it accounts for less than 1% of the CPU load, less than 10 kilobytes of memory per connection, and 2% of network overhead. Basically, encrypting everything, I'm not compressing it, uh, didn't have any significant effect on their server. So you can't argue that it's going to cause a performance hit. Uh, and sensitive data like security information or anything that is business specific to you should be encrypted really. Assume your database is going to get out somehow. Uh, protect sensitive information via URL, so using national insurance numbers, uh, probably not a good idea in the URL. Uh, and in the case of the NHS website I was working on where a number of users are always using the same site, the, the same desk to, to register disable autocomplete. Uh, and the best countermeasure for sensitive data exposure is don't store it in the first place. So um, part of PCI compliance, you're not allowed to store the CVV code. It's illegal. Uh, so in security essential projects, I enforce SSL. I ensure something called the HSTS header. So basically it says that once it's been requested over SSL, I can only ever be requested over SSL in the future. So that stops the, the Wi Fi pineapple attack. Okay, and I think we'll break for pizza. Yeah, come on, have yourself to pizza. That's what I forgot. Right, well, I hope that's been useful so far. Um, uh, people have said to me in the break, I can't believe this kind of thing still happened, but I've seen it, I've seen it in the wild, and the losses of multinational corporations um, you know, are a testament to the fact that this is still going on, and in a big way. So, uh, the seventh most impactful vulnerability out in the world at the moment is missing function level access control. So what does that mean? Again, it's checking the user has to be there, <coughs> So, for instance, just if you've got an admin section of your website, check that the user is an admin. Uh, I know this is going to seem Mickey Mouse to you, but actually this happens so often. Uh, so, in MVC, authorized roles equals admin. It's, it's not, it shouldn't be difficult, and yet. So, the .NET framework uh, helps you out a lot. It provides authorization tags and, and roles, but it's very easy to knock that off if you're a developer and you want to get around it for some way. Um, so you can secure it uh, path level in web.config, that's really e uh, easy and effective way, you can do it using the tags, uh, and particularly the controller level, so if you add on another method, 
that anything on that control has already got the same emissions levels. Uh, and then any point in code, you can just check that users enroll using the authentication framework. Um, and any methods on the controller that aren't meant to be able to execute all over the internet, you can just use non-action. Uh, so other things you should do, uh, don't show links on the UI for unauthorized functions, just show the ones that are uh, there and don't make server side checks. So back to the point about you know, validating what's in the cookie that's going back, don't assume that that's correct. So you're assuming anything the user is sending back is correct. You can craft HTML posts with what information you want uh, and, and fire it at the server and do that in an automated way. So don't, don't rely on inf security information you've already sent down to the client solely. Um, obfuscating licks is no protection. Uh, I used to work for, uh, I worked briefly for a uh, well-known northern airline and uh, in the call center application, uh, there was this page where you can credit accounts with free air miles. Um, so the, the, the menu section checked that the, the user should have the permissions to, to see the item, but actually if you knew the URL, you could go directly to that web page and then credit any account you wanted with as many free air miles as you wanted, which could potentially have cost the airline in question millions of pounds. Uh, practice leads. <laughs> 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 uh, so, and practice leads privilege. So, uh, if if you need to cut up a, a permission uh, into admin uh, and call center admin to reduce the amount of permissions it has, then then do that rather than putting it in a sort of global admin category. Um, so, I didn't think you could be able to do this. But you can actually unit test this, that the, the, the right attributes are on the right methods. Uh, and this proves that you, you've got the right level of authentication authorization on your system. Uh, so in the Security Essentials project, I do some unit tests that show you how to do that. So if someone uh, whips them off for whatever reason, you'll start getting failing tests. I don't think it's quite a useful feature. So number eight, cross-site request forgery. What's that about? So the attack works like this. An attacker sends you with a malicious link uh, and something like mysite.com.logon. Now, you'll all know that that performs a, an HTTP GET against that. So if they receive um, this link with this image in it, that just by viewing the link, it will log you off the website. And that assumes that you're logged on to the website, obviously. So that's a very benign instance of what cross-site request forgery is, but it kind of illustrates how it, how it works. Requires the user to be logged on. Um, so what's your, what's your router's IP address? 192.168.101? Yeah, pretty much the same as everyone else's. So all you really need in, for a router that's um, got a cross-site Cross site request forgery vulnerability in it is to know the IP address you're finding that and have the user go to a web page. You then craft a jQuery post of whatever to this known IP address or, or website address, and then it can do whatever you want. So, in this case, uh, the TP link routers had this vulnerability built into it. So, when you went on the website, it would then do uh, behind the scenes an HTTP post against the router and the what. And the particular page it was affecting was um, the, the, the page that had all the DNS um, server entries in. <coughs> so it was replacing um, a known set of good DNS servers with their bad set of DNS servers. So anytime you went to google.com, for instance, after that, it would go to evilgoogle.com invisibly behind the scenes. And it could do this because you've logged onto your router and any time it does a post or get or anything against that site, it sends the authentication cookie with it. It knows to do that. All browsers do that. So uh, there were 300,000 routers reprogrammed using this. Uh, DNS service change. Uh, staggeringly known about for over a year, nothing was done about it. Uh, and in Brazil, 4.5 million routers were reprogrammed. 
So yeah, I mean, Router is a, a, an easy example, but it could be any website. So if they've been on your website, they've been logged in, and there's a, a, a post or something crafted against your website can be used to log, log off or post secure information or change information. So how do you test, how do you um, countermeasure this? So what you do is you put the anti-forgery token in. Um, that goes in your Razor syntax on, <coughs> on every page, usually on the layout page, so it goes with every request. And then on uh, that, so when you get the HTML back, you've got this request verification token here uh, with this cryptographically secure massive string that's about this long. Um, so something unique is being sent down with every get, which <coughs> when you post it back will then be checked on the server by valid this validate anti-forgery token. So what this means is, whenever you post back, the server knows that the post has come from the site, the page that it has sent down, and not the <coughs> third party site, the cross site request. Yeah. Is it true that um, for modern browsers that are passing origin headers, that's a reasonable replacement for pure Pallada that anti request forgery tokens can do? So if you validate it, it is an origin token, Well, what does the origin header contain? Uh, well, the domain of where it's. Yeah, but I can craft it using like Postman or Fiddler. I can craft any HTML, HTTP post hook that I want and have whatever headers it wants. I want it to have. Uh, true, but you've got to have also then nick the cookie on the server or jack the cookie to do any use. You've yeah, but it prevents against. Yeah, okay, you're still logged in, but there's nothing contained in that header that says that it originated from that server, because that can be forged. It's just uh, an HTTP message being sent back at the end of the day. There's nothing unique about that header. Whereas in the, in this case, the, the, the request token contains something unique which is associated with the request, and the server knows about that. So there is a you know, next to impossible chance of that being forged. Uh, so frequently forgotten about are Ajax calls. You just need to put a little bit of extra um, code in there, and that will put the grab the the token there and send it back with Ajax calls. Uh, Web form is really bad on this. Um, don't have, didn't have much um, support for cross site request forgery uh, until later versions. Yes. Sir. So, so with Ajax calls, if you're not using a post Ajax request, if you're a form post, if you're doing JSON. You have to roll your own attribute on the server side because it will it will only look for a form field with the request um, to say this is the request verification token. So if you want to do a JSON serialized submit via AJAX, you have to roll your own attribute for the um, yeah uh, anti forgery. Yeah, there's a little bit of extra code you need to. It's not difficult to do if you look into the MVC source code. You just need to be aware of that. Happily, I've already implemented that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for bringing it up. Now, one of the problems with the request token is, say somebody's come to your homepage and they don't want to log in just yet. After, after an hour they want to log in, they just take enter your username and password in. And you get the yellow screen. Because the, the, the cookie is in front of you. Uh, that sounds like an authentication. It's using the request authentication token. You've got two parts to it. What does the other, what does the yellow so screen no, say? No, it's not the cookie expired. It's a session on the server that expired. So it's yeah, that sounds that. like they had a session started in some way. In which case, you just need to redirect them to the login page. But if you've got a page that's got the username and password boxes there, and it's your, it's your <coughs> site, main site home page. Yeah. Then. And but my bank does this annoyingly. It, it, I go to the login page and it starts the session and then I come back 15 minutes later and actually put my account details in and click post and it says you've been you've actually been logged out. Well I never logged in, but it thinks I logged in because on the server it started the session for me. It's it's just not handling the session well and it should just take the information that I've already provided to it and, and submit it and cancel the session on the server. I think that's what happened. I may be wrong in your case. Yeah. 
to a timeout. It's it, 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 to a timeout. Uh, it's, it's but let's authenticate because it shouldn't start there. <coughs> no. Or it should handle it gracefully and <coughs> just redo it for In order to get the uh, request authentication thing to the browser, that, that magic number, um, it has to start a session on the server so that the browser knows that it's connected to that session on the server. Yeah, but there's no need to start a session and you're actually logged in because the session doesn't contain anything and your application should be checked in my view. Okay. Your session automatically starts as soon as you go to a page. Yeah, but then it sounds like something in your application is validating that, and that's what's causing the yellow screen. Because I, I don't, no. I don't recognise the yellow screen as. You've got, you've got your web page, your, your home page at this site. You've got username and password, login box in there. You've also got it with the request authentication. Validate it. Leave the page for an hour, go to the sign in, username, password, click login, and you get your yellow screen because it, it can't match that token with the server because the server session is timed out. You can capture that error. Yeah. I've handled it a different way, actually. That might be your cookie configuration. Sorry? It might be your cookie configuration. What it will do by default is it will match a form field that's injected into the page at the time of render. So that that's immutable effectively. That's there until you do something on the yeah. page. And the cookie. If your cookie is expiring, it won't be able to match it. The other thing you'll come a cropper with is if people log in twice. So if I go to log in and then go to log in and log in on one of the pages and then try and log in on one of the other pages, <coughs> because my token has an encoded this is for anonymous. But I'm now Fred. It will throw an error. That's something you've got to watch out for, and that happens surprisingly often on the product. The Salesforce team would go out and they'd open tab, 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 tab. Log. Oh, we're not logged in on any of them. I'll log in. Switch tab. Log in. Immediately got an error page. Doesn't look good to the client. That is something you have to watch out for. But what it will do is it will match the token submitted with the form with the cookie. So you might want to check your cookie configuration and timeouts. Okay. We can have an offline conversation yeah. if you want to, but we've got more ground to cover. So. Okay, number nine on the list, uh, using components with known vulnerabilities. So, uh, yeah, WordPress, rich, rich seam of uh, security vulnerabilities. They don't seem to employ, implement security in a, in a consistent manner, or lots of SQL injection vulnerabilities, like in the three-year-old admin module that was um, in WordPress in 2013, tens of thousands of sites were affected. Um, you could just power through the admin module, doing a brute force against it, um, gathering user information and admin credentials. Uh, yeah, circumvent access controls, SQL injection, stuff like skipping. Uh, tend to keep all server servers patched, NuGate packages updated. Um, fly windows updates you know, it, it's really boilerplate stuff so has anyone done Sean Wildermuth's ASP.net ASP 5 module uh, course yes yeah yeah. I, I just love how he, he, he wrote uh, an unvalidated redirect vulnerability into his, <coughs> his course so it, it happens to the best of us Okay, so um, you're on a site. You've been on the site before, but your session's expired. Uh, so then it goes, oh, hang on, you're not authenticated. Chucks you over to your, your sign-in page and then return URL, uh, the, 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 the page you are requesting. Let's say uh, you receive this, this link via um, email, social media, something like that. All of that's hidden. You don't show that in the link, um, but the unvalidated redirect will, 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 will take you to the sign-in page, and once you're logged in, it will kick you off to whatever's in that, right? So in this vulnerability, it's taking me to nasty site as soon as it logs me in. So the web, the web application is not checking that the, the return URL is actually one that belongs to this, its site. 
So typically what happens, user logs into safe trusted site, ebay.com for instance. Um, the, the return URL redirects to nasty site. Nasty site looks exactly like ebay.com, but it says at the top, um, your login has failed, please re-enter your username password combinations. So you put in your username password into nasty eBay, it then gets stored in the database, and then it redirects you to the original eBay. So to you, it just looks like you, you typed in the Duff password the first, first time. You didn't see it happen. Any redirecting URL is vulnerable, so it doesn't have to be on the, uh, the, the, the login. That, that's what, where it typically happens. But it could be anywhere in the database you store a URL and direct users to. <laughs> so if they can change that content, um, then you're susceptible to an invalid redirect. Um, MVC was vulnerable by default, and then they fixed it in MVC4. So it just says in MVC4, uh, redirect to local. So rather than redirect wherever that you return URL says, it just uh, does that URL block. Redirect to local is URL is local URL. Does it belong to my site? If it's not, um, just go to the home page. Trivially simple. But Sean Wildermuth wrote uh, open redirect vulnerability in his latest course, which, you know, mind boggles, but there you go. Um, form over placing. So this is particularly, this is not OWASP top 10, but if you're an MVC developer, you need to know about this, because uh, it's something that particularly affects you. So when you post data back, and you've got something like try update model, update model, it will take that object model that comes back in through the form post, uh, and let's say I'm post, I'm changing a uh, my first name to Scott uh, because there's a field on the front page that says Scott. Um, but then my user table also has a field called is admin. I can then craft uh, using this composer like uh, Fiddler or Postman is admin equals true. So because I've got a sort of blanket try update model that will update everything in the user table. I could also change the username, password, just by doing over post and concatenating on the end of that post is admin equals true or password equals blank, whatever you wanted. So you just need to implement, try out their model with the properties to update. In inverted, uh, so string array, inverted commas, username in this case. Don't let them do over pasting. Right, yes. Sorry. Uh very quick and easy alternative is just to have a model, which is literally what you expect to see from your user. Yeah, so data transfer object. Yeah, and then update your, your primary entity from that rather than have your primary entity be what object you expect to see. Yeah. Right, so if you do all that, you will be secure against 80% of the vulnerabilities that are in the web today. Hallelujah. So anyone, anyone think that you know, there's things I need to go back tomorrow and have a look at? Oh, great. You're all doing brilliantly. Right, so core concept one, don't trust your users. Validate all inputs. Uh, use an object relational mapper or stored procedures for your data to protect against secret injection. So just doing a review of everything we've done. Uh, using a strong account management process. Uh, and work out if bits of your account management process could actually cause vulnerabilities in other people's account management processes or theirs could cause vulnerabilities in yours. Use capture and throttling for any part of that surface area. Um, don't let them enumerate all accounts in your system. Uh, hash passwords, encrypt secure, uh, sensitive data. Uh, so someone raised the point of the interval, you know, do, uh, if I encrypt every field, is it going to cause a performance uh, hit if I then do searching on the field? Yes, it will, but at SQL Server, you can encrypt the entire database as well if you want to take that angle and uh, it's a lower performance hit. Practice least privilege, only do them what they're allowed to do. Use and enforce SSL, encode all output to prevent cross-site scripting attacks. Secure direct object references, make sure that they're meant to be there. Uh, you can see there errors and trace, that show, show the internals of how the application works. Use anti-forgery tokens to block cross-site request forgery attacks. 
Keep Windows up to date, keep NuGet up to date, benefit from the security updates that delivered to your system daily. Validate redirects, prevent all remote posting. Uh, we didn't cover denial of service headers or social engineering. Right, so now you've protected yourself against 80% of all known attacks on the web today. Fantastic, but you're probably not in charge of the server. So, um, you need to talk to your server bot, uh, if that's you, fantastic, if it's not. Um, SSLlabs.com has a, a fantastic site on what you should be doing regarding SSL. SSL is, can be free if you want. Actually, there's a story on that board for Capital One over there, um, upgrade to TLS 1.2. I was like, wow, that's so good. The message is getting through. Yeah, 1.2 is the most secure. SSL 2 and 3 are not secure at all. And that site will tell you that and tell you what the best policy is as we, as we stand today. Um, that will counter against the Poodle attack, which is an SSL downgrading attack. Um, basically, if uh, um, the if you craft the uh, the request in a certain way and stagger the 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 request, the server times out and then downgrades to a lower form of SSL, which is crackable. So that was the Poodle attack. So you need a, a strong SSL policy, or a TLS really. Encrypt the connection string on the production server. It can only be done on the box itself. Enable retail mode on the production server. Machine.config. Patch the server always, as much as possible. Uh, and then you can run uh, Troy Hunter's safer web uh, on a periodic basis to check the security. So if you're interested, the OS top 10 run a fantastic site. It's got a great PDF which gives examples of everything I've been talking about, how you can craft the attacks and show whether you're vulnerable or not vulnerable. Um, there's loads of great content on Plural site. Uh, despite my comment, it's about Sean Wilsmuth. There's lots of uh, Troy Hunt's uh, content is really great. Uh, he said ethical hacker certification if you want to go the extra mile. Um, ZDNet is a really good resource on who's getting cracked and how much money they're losing because of it. Um, and <coughs> the Security Now um, podcast is a guy who's been going, uh, ever, I think, since um, since they're all mainframes. Uh, he's a really great resource and knows his stuff. And uh, he's a very long podcast, but he, he goes through in detail and explains things how um, uh, to you and how all, all the security works. Uh, another thing, if you really want to scare yourself shit, let's go and do a course on Carly Linux and show how absolutely unbelievably easy it is to hack people. You know, this is really weaponized hacking. It, it's kind of like uh, one command, expose URL on web. You then send the URL to um, a user. Uh, it tr if the user clicks on the link, it tries 57 different exploits against their browser. If one of them succeeds, opens a backdoor into their system, which is perpetual and resilient, and reboots in their system invisibly to the user, you then open another, another command in your system, which will then open a sec secure and invisible command prompt into their system, um, and you can do all, and once you're there, you're running on admin privileges, even if they don't have admin privileges, and you can do anything you want to their system. And that's literally three lines of code. What was that for? Carly Linux. So what pen test did you use? So hacks are increasing in number and sophistication. Uh, even today, the, the losses are huge. It's becoming more and more of an important issue. You guys are in a position to do something about it. So you know, <coughs> lead the way. Uh, we've covered the OWASP top 10. So if you, co if you prevent, cover yourself from these, then you'll cover yourself against 80% of the threats that are out there in the world today. Uh, provided specific solutions in MVC via the slides, but also the Security Central's project. The slides will be on SlideShare, and I'll put the Security Central's project link, which is on GitHub, later. So feel free to um, have a look at that, tear it to pieces, tell me I'm wrong. Constructive feedback is helpful. So hopefully in the, in the future we'll have a bit more of this, and a bit less of this. Okay. <laughs> right. What was that? Um, there's a URL, a saferweb.com, was it? Uh, yeah, it's Troy Hunt's um, website. So a you can safer web, just one Yeah, A S A F A. Okay. Uh, yes. How good straight bad is file new project? 
the Visual Studio 2015, let's say. It sets a good, it sets a good base. So I've seen a lot of what you've put in there as just boilerplate these days, certainly anti yeah, forgery tokens. Yeah, I mean, that's why I set this. I mean, the security credentials project, I'll come to you next, uh, is basically file new project on an MV, a standard MC template, everything upgraded, and then the, the security bit is put in. So it should be boilerplate. Right. How close but, to your 85% is it? Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, you're setting yourself up for a, a set of new good habits to get it to. How close to your 85% is that boilerplate? Is it miles away? Is there loads to do still? Or? Um, there's stuff around uh, account management that I need to put a lot more work into. Right. But yeah, there's, there's a lot there. There's a lot more than you get out of the box with file new project. Right, okay. Yes. Uh, last 10 VCI played with some VC4. MBC5 and it's MBC Next now. Has much changed? Are the lessons from MBC4 still valid? Or is that whole new ballpark trying to make them fancy MBC5? Um, with each successive version, they've, they've added more on. So I think the main version with MBC uh, is 4 or 5 was the claims based authentication, which right. is um, a better system than the, the previous uh, authentication system. Right. Proper declarations and things are still working, still valid. Yeah, yeah. There's nothing, nothing obsolete. They just, they keep adding to it. Yes. How do you spell authenticity? Kali. K A I. K A L I. K A. Yeah. Uh, it's Linux, so you may feel a little dirty. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a thing that you can point at a URL and press get. Yeah. That's all it is. Well, if you install it on the server and go expose endpoint, it'll then generate a URL for you, which you can then send on to someone. So it needs to exist on an external server somewhere. You can do it internally yourself if you want and run Kali Linux in a VM. That's what I do. But yeah, it's, it's frightening stuff. That it's just all automated. You don't need any intelligence uh, to hack systems. It's, it's really weaponized. Any more questions? Played around with the NuGet for the MBC <coughs> boilerplate. Uh, but certain claims about improving various aspects of the uh, store control for stuff. I've not used MBC some of the, some of them. just mentioned some of the criteria. You know, it says by default certain things aren't. You know, uh, yeah, it's probably taking the same approach as NW yeah. WebSec, which yeah. enforces certain headers. Yeah, that's all he was mentioning. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I've not used that. Yeah. And yeah. I'll do another question as well. Um, you have a chance to play with MBC six yet? Uh, the security concerns that mind you. Uh, no, it's probably security is better. It usually is for Microsoft. Right, okay. Yeah, it's got. It's not been released yet, though, is it? It's still in the uh, release candidate stage. I think it is released. Yeah, I think we're. It's, uh, supposed to be. It was, well, it's it's, it's, it's MVC Core now, isn't it? .NET Core. Yeah, well, that's that's the ASP net side of things, but yeah, it's, it's just called MVC Six. Um, but I think it's not due to release till till uh, end of March. They keep putting the date back. It was before it used to be released before Christmas. Yeah. That's why I put it somewhere like RC candidate one or something. One big win you get is that all your content you want to publish is static content now lives in a www root folder. Yeah. So the root right, yeah, application yeah, is no longer public yeah. accessible. Yeah. So you haven't got to worry about kind of blacklisting. I don't want to serve CS Proj files because yeah. they're actually public. You might put in .CS Proj. Anything that's in your www root is then theoretically stuff yeah. that you want to be public and then anything that's outside of it just isn't available. Yeah, we were going to use that on the new project and then because of that it's just basically it's just the problem at the minute is just too new at the moment. Not really. Well, the things like um, we were going to have support for PCP power views in it so we wanted to have portable areas in the VC of that they've now taken out so we're going to take out PCP power views. Right. Um, is that through a security risk? I think it's because there's too many bugs in it. Oh, right. Um, but they said they're not going to not going to re, uh, reintroduce it until um, something like six dot one <coughs> down the line. Uh, which is a bit of a drag. Okay. Any questions? Wasn't that CK edit? Uh, it was the okay. specific admin module that's done on patch for you that was vulnerable to CK injection. So I've been getting a lot of CK editing um, attempts, and I say I'm not using it, I'm using it myself. Um, I've got 
for the likes of Pete Davidson, so that's been a red light. So my guess is there's a botnet running somewhere that's pounding every website it can find looking for CK so vulnerability. Yeah. And they will exist. So keep your keep your server components patched. Okay, right, I hope that was useful. Uh, if you have any constructive feedback, please feedback. It's always uh, helpful. And uh, thanks for listening. Uh, just a couple of things to finish up. Uh, I got a couple of Jet Brains Live success. So I thought two questions based on John's talk. First one is you get three Jet Brains Live if you answer this. Is um, what was the first vulnerability that John discussed? I think the gentleman in the red jumper is there. Okay. And the, the second one is, um, what should you do with all user input? <laughs> okay, cheers. You two get a jet brand. And uh, finally, yeah, thanks to Capital One. They host us every month. Thanks to eDays for sponsoring. And thanks to John for talking. Cheers. <laughs>